They've recently dropped their prices. If you guys are looking to have websites like your own works of art out there, like hosted in the cloud somewhere, Linode saves me a ton of money over Azure and AWS. I've, I've done both of them, uh, or all three of them actually, and Linode just saves me a lot of money. So for what I'm doing, Linode is great. Also, if you wanted to do more sophisticated things, if you were into like machine learning uh, or anything like that, then they do have dedicated CPU plans, which are also still just a fraction of the cost. Um, if you guys are interested uh, in trying to host your own stuff, just check out Linode. There's a $20 discount in the description tab below. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey guys, what's up? So in this video, I'm talking about the, really it's just six recommended libraries in Python to get started programming in Python. A lot of people, they're like, when they're getting started programming, they'll make like console apps where Python will ask a question. Your, your, your Python program, it like asks a question, you answer it, it repeats it back or does some sort of a if statement, you know, if else there to try to give little crafty feedback messages. But those things are kind of boring and like, I remember when I was like first getting started, I, I started there, you know, the, obviously the hello world and then these little console things that kind of spit out different types of text, almost like a, a like an old school text adventure, uh, adventure game type of thing. Uh, but that's where I, I ultimately started. But then I struggled to figure out, like, how do I take it to another level? What do I do? And really the best way is to start seeing like immediate results, I think, by using libraries that that can like give you that immediate immediate feedback all right so the first recommendation if you're going to be doing web development at all with python um, i would say that you can normally go to flask and start developing in flask but i think flask is actually too high level and that's actually not my recommendation for what to, to jump into with python web development i actually think that the better option is to use what flask is built on top of and that is this work zoog library here um, and it's just a it's a it's a Python server library that uses WSGI and WSGI is something that can communicate with Apache so that Apache can um, run Python applications. I believe in Nginx as well, probably. Don't quote me on that. I've used use uh, uWSGI and WSGI on Apache. I don't know if it works on Nginx. I just use Nginx on my Django stuff for front uh, like client um, static content, CSS, stuff like that. Yeah. But anyway, the reason why I recommend this is because you can get immediate um, immediate feedback. You're not going to have to deal with like actually opening up ports and dealing with sockets and things like that with Python. That's because Python, you can do that. It's very low level. This WorkZoog library is doing that. Um, but this is going to be much lower level to what is going on there than what Flask is going to provide you. So I think for a beginner developer if they could actually just try to you know see if they can build something that works inside of here mess around with it for a while by the time you do that and then you do switch over to flask you'll realize that flask is doing like a lot of things uh for you very well um because it is built on top of this particular library so when it comes to python servers there's some great ones out there um like even tornado is a, is a pretty good one as well because it's very node like uh but Anyway, this is probably the easiest one, I think, to get started with. If you're looking to get into machine learning, even as a beginner, some people will say start with like TensorFlow. TensorFlow is going to be way, way too complicated for any sort of beginner Python developer. Uh, most likely any sort of machine learning stuff out there is going to be probably too daunting for most beginners. But beginner programmers love to just like jump out, jump in there. And like I've done it before, so why not? Um, go ahead and just jump into this Keras library then because this is going to make it a lot easier. Um, just it, you're still going to have to deal with obviously organizing your data and plotting and everything, but um, this is going to be a lot easier to deal with than TensorFlow. So even easier than that though, I would probably say that if this is something that is a little bit too difficult to grasp for any sort of beginner, and I actually don't recommend it for beginners, but if you're going to do it anyway, um, you might as well jump into something that, that might be a little bit funner uh, with a little bit more immediate feedback. And that is this uh, face recognition library that has like 23,000 stars on GitHub. This thing's pretty awesome, but you can use Python um, to use your own image and you can use your own images and things like that and start playing around with actual uh, facial detection features using Python. So a very cool thing to do. And it's very much, it, you know, it's, it's like Keras, it can be used for all types of different things, right? Not just images, but this is a, a, a library that's specifically micro focused on images and probably a much easier thing for machine learning people for python developers just getting started all right so the next one is going to be if you're trying to build any sort of uh, reusable software so say you want to build some sort of python scraping bot or something like that 
And um, it's going to be a bunch of Python source code, but you want to wrap that up into some sort of GUI, which is graphical user interface, um, so that somebody can use your tool a little bit easier. Well, one of the easiest ones, the oldest ones out there to use, is the uh, tkinter library, which is the interface to this TCLTK. Uh, it, it actually is packaged with Python, so that's one of the reasons why it's the easiest thing to get started with. Um, that said, it's not going to be that easy because it doesn't really hold your hand that much, but there's not that much to it. So you're going to see eventually, okay, I can create this class application, kick out a tk.frame, and that's going to create your box of your application for you. You can set your sizes and things like that. So um, there's, there's just not a whole lot to it. And again, the, the results are almost immediate, like the feedback is almost immediate. Unfortunately, the documentation kind of suffers on this. I think it needs to be updated because it's still a very usable library for people getting their feet wet. Uh, but the uh, t t uh, tutorials and everything out there, they're all very old, but they still work. All right, so the next recommendation is if you're going to be doing any sort of video game, Pygame also comes included with your Python installation. And you can do some pretty cool stuff with it. So if you're trying to build some 2D side scrollers, we've seen 2D side scrollers make a ton of money. It's a great way to start video gaming. Um, so basically, you could go out there and try to use Unreal Engine with C++ or uh, Unity Engine with C Sharp. Those are all great tools as well. But this is like a perfect way to start for a Python developer that is just getting their feet wet. Like you can learn a lot about video gaming itself by just starting with a 2D game, sticking with a 2D side scroller or like a top down, you know, 3D adventure type of thing. Um, but you could do all that with with Pi Game. Uh, probably not the best tool for it, but like I would go very, very small. Probably something like, um, you know, Pong or like Tetris. Uh, if uh, not Tetris, Te <laughs> Tetris is the, uh, the the worst actual example of any sort of game to make. Probably because the game is very, very difficult. Uh, anyway, do something very, very easy. Start with like the old school Atari games that like were so bad, like the ET game from 1984. All right, so the next one is going to be a library that was created from a fellow Virginian, Kenneth Reitz, uh, who created Python requests, actually a bunch of other stuff. But this is a great library for making HTTP requests using Python. Um, and that can seem like such a basic thing, but that's how all servers and that's how the entire World Wide Web communicates. So data is being transferred back and forth, uh, XML, JSON, H uh, HTML, just raw text. And using this, you can actually then communicate with all these different servers. So if you're looking to screen scrape, if you're looking to automate any sort of data collection from API endpoints out there, this is the best tool in the in industry uh, for Python. So although it's a little bit advanced, maybe for a, a, an absolute beginner, a lot of beginner Python developers are trying to get data. They're trying to build automated things that can kind of uh, grab data and then, you know, kind of manipulate it. But a lot of that data they need to grab is sitting on a server somewhere. So in order to grab that data, this is the, the best library in order to do it. Um, and you can just use some of the superficial top most features of it, you know, keep it very simple, request.get, you know, you get a response back. And then you can start getting the actual text. Uh, this is the JSON response, assuming that the server is returning JSON data. Um, but anyway, that's just an example here. It doesn't just deal with uh, JSON data. You can get HTML. You can then take that HTML, use a library like Beautiful Soup in Python to then start scraping through that, um, or just using regular expressions or whatever to find whatever sort of data that it is that you're looking for. All right, so then the final library that I'm going to recommend here is the Python Pillow library. And this is a pill fork. Pill, I think, is probably originally written in like C or C++, but the reason why this is cool is because a lot of people want to do projects that deal around image manipulation, right? So you create a tool. One time I created a tool. My first open source project was for Django in 2014. Um, and even back then, like I had to use Pillow um, because it was like a, uh, a thumbnail project. So I was actually taking images and, and dynamically resizing them, trying to keep the aspect ratio, trying to not lose. Um, it, it, you deal with like this lossless uh, quality or whatever, like anyway you can lose image quality obviously as you resize it so pill is doing a lot of that stuff for you and, and python's pillow library is just a way to communicate with that and there's just so much you can do with it so really all these libraries i mentioned you could actually combine them all together you could create a video game that um ultimately makes http requests using python requests if you wanted to you know like 
I'm not sure. I've never actually tried to do that. But anyway, the point is, though, you could use a request, though, to reach across the web to get images to then store the images. But before you store them, you could use Pillow to evaluate, resize them. You could even take the image then and then start running it through your image um, machine learning algorithms, you know, using something like Keras or that, that facial recognition thing. But uh, like one of those things that I was saying earlier is like one of the complications with machine learning is that you have to collect the data. So collecting the data is difficult. So how do you collect it? Well, you have to write spiders and those spiders need to go out and, and get all the images that you're probably legally allowed to grab, right? So you then grab those images and you download them somewhere and then you're gonna be resizing them using Pillow and then you're gonna have to then write Python programs to then go through all those images and then somehow you know feed those into your, your neural network, assuming that it's already set up. But um, that's basically the gist of it. So you use different Python libraries to do different things and you don't just, you don't reinvent the wheel. You know, there's, there's so much code out there that does what you need it to do but it's all ultimately python code but you'd be surprised how much time um actual senior developers are spending just literally just communicating with apis around large large libraries and just connecting them all together all right so if you guys are trying to learn programming uh make sure you check out my courses on udemy i'm releasing new stuff all the time and uh for web development check out this web development in 2019 that covers a lot of information all right guys thanks for watching have a good day bye